Well, hi there. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Stan Rollman. I am the research director with Earthwatch Institute. Um, gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest presenter today. Uh, Dr. Dave Oliar uh, is the uh, principal investigator for the following forest owls in Western US Forest Project that we've been supporting since 2016. Um, Dave is the senior scientist with Hawkwatch International and has been there for six years now. Um, before that, Dave was a um, doctoral student at the University of Washington, studying under Dr. John Marsloff in the Forest Resources and Wildlife Ecology Program at the University of Washington, as well as the Urban Ecology Program. And it's really fun to look over Dave's uh, CV and to to, he's a great example of someone who kind of sent, set his compass bearing to studying birds of prey throughout his undergrad, master's degree, and his uh, doctoral re research, and has set a career following that same uh, compass bearing, studying raptors, uh, not just in Western U.S. forests, but uh, all over the world with some of his other work. Um, it looks like we have uh, good attendance. So without any further ado, please uh, help me welcome Dr. Dave Oliar. Dave, I think you are still muted. I don't know if Diana can fix that or if you can fix that. There we go. Um, am I here? Excellent. So um, thank you, Stan. Thank you, um, everyone at Earthwatch, and thanks for everyone for, for tuning in today. I'm, I'm delighted to um, be here to talk about some of the research that we're doing um, that, that, that Stan mentioned in the Western forests of, of, of North America. Um, and I will very shortly get to owls. Um, but in the spirit of this being part of a, web, a webinar series that, that addresses forests, um, and, and changes to forest and climate change impacts on forest. I'm gonna start by sort of trying to set the stage for why we're doing the work that we're doing. Um, the image that you see here in front of you um, is basically coniferous forest in the Western United States. And it's a pretty common image. There's, uh, there's ponderosa pine here. There's some Douglas fir right here. Um, this um, particular location is unique in that you probably wouldn't expect to see this forest where it was taken, where the picture was taken. This is from the Chiricahua Mountains in southeast Arizona and not many people think of coniferous forest when they think of, of um, southeast Arizona, but once you get to high elevations you do get this, this land cover type. Um, and so when we think about forests in the west, this is a common type of forest. Um, and when we start to think about um, climate change impacts and what forests are going to look like into the future, we um, have to think about the niche that the, these forests occur in, in, in terms of the climate envelope. And so looking at climate envelope is one of the things that a lot of biologists do, plant biologists and wildlife biologists, and try to project where something occurs now, if we model and look at different climate models where we expect that those conditions to occur into the future is where we would expect some of those species to occur as well, right? And so keep that in mind when I show you a couple of maps here. Here's a map. These two maps here, you can, you can see at the bottom. So on the left is Ponderosa pine and on the right is Douglas fir. And those are those two trees that I highlighted here. Um, but the, the red areas on this map, essentially, this is the current distribution of these two tree species. Um, and this is the current distribution of them modeled by climate conditions, right? And so this is where we have both of these species now. And you can see right down here, this little red dot, that's the Chiricahua Mountains. That's where this picture was taken right here. Both of those species occur here. And now what what climate scientists do to try to understand the changes and ranges of these forests is to project those climate conditions into the future. So this next set of images is using a climate model to say, well, given the, what we expect the conditions to look like in 2030, this would be the distribution of the niche or the, the, the areas where these tree species could occur. And hopefully what you noticed there is we went from a whole lot of red, because that's where the species are, to 
less red in some less ideal um, situations where we currently do have that tree species, right? That's, that's kind of a, a, a big change that's for two dominant species in Western US forests. And I, I also have to note that this is projecting to 2030. That's 12 years or 11 years from now, actually. So that's not too far off, right? And the, the beauty of these models is that we can project based on what we know and understand what we expect 30 years from then. And as you can see, there's far less red on this map. And then we can go another 30 years. And so here's the projected climate niche envelope for Douglas fir and Ponderosa fir in the year 2090. And so if, if that's what we expect to see, we see shrinking, shrinking and changing distributions of these two species in the Western US, right? So that, that has implications for um, all of the wildlife that occur in forests that, that are dominated by these two species, but that has implications for um, natural resource industry too. So that's um, coniferous forest. If we take another look, here is if we go lower down in elevation in the Chiricahua Mountains, we start to get into Madrian pine oak forest. So we've got some pines, they're different pines, but we also have um, two different oak species. And the oak species I'm going to talk about is the emery oak. Okay, and so this is looking at the same kind of map. So here's the distribution, current distribution of emery oak right now. And watch the time series of the red. You basically want to be watching for change in red and yellow. And so there's in 12, there's in 11 years, there's in the year 2060, and there's in the year 2090. Like actually Emory Oak is starting to, uh, you know, in terms of climate conditions, this is where I'm sitting right, right, right here. So we're going to have Emory Oak close to where, where I live soon. Uh, well, not soon, 2090. Um, but the point here is if you look, so this, in this case, we don't necessarily have a shrinking distribution for this species but we've got a shifting distribution of that forest type kind of moving north in terms of where we would expect it to be. And that can have repercussions for the species that live in those areas as well, and I'll get to that eventually. Last set of, of this type of a map. So here's um, a picture from Northern Utah, the Wasatch Mountains, and this is Aspen Forest. Um, and so, this is what you can expect to see up at around 6,000 6, to 8,000 feet in, in basically anywhere in the Rocky Mountains. Um, this is at our study site in Utah. And I'm going to show you the shifting, the prediction for what Aspen Forest is going to do. Here's current. So this, this image is from right there where my pointer is. And that's the current distribution of Aspen Forest. Here's where we expect it to be based on climate and elevation conditions in 11 years. Note that quite a bit of red dropped off. And here's where we expect it in 2060. And here's where we expect it in 2090. So that's quite a bit of shift, quite a bit of shift and, and um, contraction of the range for this plant species. And so if you're interested in wildlife or anything to do with forest, Aspen forest in the Western US, um, this model would lead you to be a little bit concerned. Right. Um, two or three things to, to point out really quickly is these are the results of just one model. There are hundreds of climate models to predict what if this happens, what if this happens, what if X, Y, or Z happens. And the models produce different results. But what's important to note is the overall trend. Most of those models suggest very similar range shifts to what these models suggest. And so when we get a lot of evidence that suggests the same thing, we try to take it seriously. Um, the, the other thing to consider here is think like a, like a tree. These, these range shifts are where it's suitable conditions for each of these tree species to be, but that doesn't mean that they're immediately there. Um, some of the aspen that is in areas that, that, are, that are no longer suitable are gonna persist, persist for an amount of time. So there's a time lag in that loss that we would expect. And then think about new forest generating. We don't get this image like that instantly. That takes 40 to 80 years until aspen forest gets to that point, right? And so the, the shifting in that timing is it's, it's important to consider. 
If you look on that map, you may or may not have noticed before, or, or the image before the picture showed up, is that there's a dead aspen right here that's a snag. And the keen eye among you might have seen this, but I'd be surprised. But if you zoomed in, this is what you would see. It's a dead aspen tree, but located in a tree hollow right there, and that aspen that's created by a, the species that excavates that is a small forest owl of the Western US. This is a, this is a nesting flammulated owl. Um, and so think about how this species has to deal with changing conditions on the landscape. So we've got those shifts in forests that we were just talking about. And so this species requires that there's trees big enough for these cavities to exist. And so how those forest coverages shift um, is going to play a part in what's available for that to happen. The species is also dependent on the processes and organisms that create those tree cavities. So whether it's a fungal rot that, that weakens a branch or even kills a tree, or it's a primary cavity um, nesting species that excavates cavities themselves, this species and group of suite, the suite of species like it are dependent on those processes to take effect in those forests and those forests have to be of a certain age. And so what I'm trying to paint here is a complex picture of shift, shifting dynamics in Western US forests. And it's not just the shift in the trees, it's you know, if you're a secondary cavity nester, which is what the species that rely on other processes to create holes in trees for them to use, if, you, if you're one of those group of species, then there's a whole lot of complex um, factors at play in terms of what's going to drive whether habitat's suitable or not for you now, but into the future too, right? And so we've got to consider those things. In the case of the flammulated owl, we also, and, and lots of other species, we have to also have to consider prey base. This is, uh, this is a forest species this is that relies and, and requires holes in trees to nest, but it also basically is tied to invertebrate species and their cycles and their timing during the breeding season, particularly when they're reliant upon um, larvae and adults of lots of noctuid moths to, to basically feed themselves and their young. And this group is gonna respond to climate change and forest practices in a different way than the cavity creators. Um, and then we've also got the added complexity of humans use these landscapes too, right? And so what I'm really trying to do is paint the picture. This, this is a complex topic and issue, and we're just starting to try to delve in to understand a little bit about that. The last player in this particular um, case, and, and sadly for this nest too, is that we have people. So we found this, this nest during an Earthwatch expedition during our first season. Um, and since then, um, a state park was put in. And unfortunately, a biking path was put in right along the stretch where this um, tree cavity occurred. And this tree cavity no longer exists because they cleared it so they could put the path in. And so um, add that to another confounding factor of what, what's, what's going on on the landscape if you're a small forest owl that relies on tree holes and lots of other things in, in, in these systems. So that brings us to our Earthwatch expedition. And so that this is, this is essentially why we're following forest owls and we're also following the tree hollows that they depend on um, in islands in the sky in southeast Arizona and also in, in northern Utah. Um, here's a picture of the flammulated owl. Um, you can see that it's, it's, it's our third smallest owl in, in Western North America. It's our only small owl that has dark eyes. And lots of people ask me why, you know, how, why does a flammulated owl have black eyes? Um, and, and when they ask uh, both me and our research team, we, we try to get them a, a better look and, and, and let them know that, well, this is actually an owl with basically a little chocolate iris. It's a dark brown eye. And this picture shows that, that quite, quite nicely. Um, I've studied owls, um, particularly I started my research career after, after um, I got into owls as, as an undergraduate um, student in Texas working with a biologist that studied eastern screech owls and then um, moved on to Utah where I started to look at impacts of ski area development on this guy, the flammulated owl, um, and that was related to development for the 2002 Winter Olympics. So if you do the math, I've been working with some of these owl species for, for quite some time. Here's an image of 
a forest at night. This is not a sunrise, but this is actually the moonrise. This is a Chiricahua moonrise that you're looking at here. And if you, you go out into any forest at night, um, if the moon is up, you'll see this. Otherwise, you'll see complete darkness. But what you'll also likely get, if you're out at the right time of day, is a whole lot of different sounds. A whiskered screech owl. Here's an elf owl. Maniacal laughing. And here's a flammulated owl. And so one of the things um, I like to stress to people and, and, and the, anyone I'm talking to about the work we're doing, but particularly to participants on our expedition that come out and, and are part of our research team, um, is that there are quite a few knowledge gaps for small owl species um, all over the world, but even in Western North America. And one of those reasons is that most owls are active at night. Um, and if you're talking about forest owls, most people don't like to find themselves out in the middle of the dark off trails and, and roads. Um, too far off and so they're not out at those times to experience those things but once you once you get over being out in the dark um, you'll see that the night's not really dark and full of, of terror um, it's full of amazingly awesome animals that are taking advantage of, of being active at night um, when it's cool when food is around and when um, danger might be um, less um, common for them and if you join our team, you'll, you'll, you'll end up basically going with the fact that the night's dark and it's full of, of owlsome. Um, so I'm gonna go over a few natural history tidbits about owls as a group for those of you that might not know a lot about them really quickly. Um, and, and getting back to talking about those tree, cal tree cavities and tree hollows, um, most North American owls, most owls are what we call secondary nesters or secondary cavity nesters. They do not make their own nests. Um, they rely upon um, other animals to create stick nests or they rely upon processes um, and other animals to create tree hollows that they might nest in. So um, they, they are, imagine trying to build a stick nest in the dark. That would, that would be um, a difficult thing to do. Um, so they rely on other organisms to create those really important habitat elements. Um, most owls are what we call nocturnal or crepuscular, but not all. Um, and so crepuscular is a $10 word for the, the um, basically that transition between day and night and night and day. Um, and the benefit to, to being crepuscular or being active during that point of time, um, uh, imagine many of you might have this last weekend gone to Sunday brunch or planning on having a brunch um, related to the holidays that are upcoming, right? Um, in terms of what's the best thing about brunch? You can have breakfast and lunch food. So you can have pancakes with french fries. And so think of, think of it that way. Uh, crepuscular animals are hunting in that zone where the daytime prey are still active if you're shifting to night and nighttime prey are starting to become active. So you get this boost in the menu. Um, and so a, a net benefit of lots of different kinds of food available, right? Um, most of these species roost during the day in cavities or in dense vegetation or against tree branches. You can see here is a flammulated owl um, nesting in a Douglas fir tree. And if this wasn't zoomed in or you were looking at this tree up at 30, 40, 50 feet up in the air, you'd be hard pressed to spot this, this owl. Even the little red flint, you know, red streaked feathers almost match in with the lichen that, that are growing on this tree. And then here's a whiskered screech owl um, roosting against a tree. And you can see that they even take on a posture where they, they basically start to look like uh, a stick. So they're, they're very camouflaged when they're roosting so that they don't get disturbed and they don't get eaten. Um, and so in addition to being nocturnal, being secondary ne cavity nesters and um, being well camouflaged for the most part, they share uh, some, some other incredible adaptations um, that I'll go through rather quickly. Um, owls see really well in low light level, much better, better than, than we do. And one of those reasons for that is that they have large tubular eyes and that they have a very high density of rods. Rods are the vision, vision cells 
um, that help enhance contrast and movement detection. So in low light, you can pick up that movement and that contrast if you have more rods in your, in your eyes. And so owls have these large, not even eyeballs, they're, they're eye tubes. And as a result, they have this added sclerotic ring that helps support that eye tube in the head. Um, so that facilitates having a large eye that captures light and has lots of surface area for rods. But what it also um, ends up doing is locking that eye into place so that owls can't really turn their eyes from side to side. Um, and to get around that, they have incredibly flexible necks. So an owl can turn, most owls can turn their heads um, 270 degrees, which is much further than we can for sure. This barn owl here is, is showing um, that flexibility um, twofold. We're looking at the back of the animal, but we're also, this is the top of the head and this is the, the mouth of that animal. So really flexible. So that basically, if you can't turn your eyes, you turn your head. And if you're trying to be a silent hunter, you wanna be able to do that without moving around. So that flexibility helps with that too. In addition to um, eyesight, owls hear really well. Um, and this is for a number of dis different reasons. Um, owls have directional hearing that surpasses us by, by quite a bit. Here's a diagram of an owl skull, it's a boreal owl. Um, and hopefully what you notice, here's the auditory canal, is that there's an offset vertically, right? Um, and so what that offset does essentially is um, you and I can get can pinpoint very well on a, an X um, axis, left to right, um, where you hear a sound. And that's because your brain processes the difference in timing between left and right ear. You fail or become much less accurate if you're doing a Y axis because your ears are on the same plane. Having this async or, or um, offset in, um, in openings on long up and down gives owls the ability to basically have that Y axis, um, axis for directional hearing. and um, and some, some of these species can basically pinpoint and find and grab a, a vole under feet of snow just by, just by sound. So pretty incredible adaptation to do that. Um, an added um, component of that is the, you know, the trait that most people think of when they think of, owl, of owls is this, this facial disc, which is modified flight feathers that basically catch and focus um, sound to the ears. And owl's ears are here and here. You can see on this picture of a, of a a bard, a bard owl, you, here's the, the opening. And interestingly enough, you see this little white um, tissue that's surrounding, that's surrounding the eye. So you're actually seeing part of the, that large tubular eyeball there as well. So owls hear really well. The other um, trait that we see that's common to most owls is, is essentially most owls are silent. And all of these traits fall along a gradient for sure. There are louder owls and there are owls that rely more on sight or sound to hunt. And so um, there's a continuum of how extreme these different traits are. Um, but as a group, as a whole, these owls share most of these traits. And so owls are silent flyers. Um, part of this is due to really soft downy plumage. Um, if you actually you know, are lucky enough to be able to encounter an owl in person and, and and feel for you know feel its plumage and you'll, you'll be amazed at how soft it is and you'll be amazed at how far your fingers actually go in until you get to the body of, of those birds it's quite um, surprising but what this does is it creates a damp softness that dampens sound um, owls also most species have feathered legs and those feathers down to the legs or toes help to break up air currents and smaller and smaller air currents make less noise and then the last adaptation are these modified flight feathers on the front edge. You can see the comb right here. That breaks up wind currents. And then this nonlinear um, back edge that also is not straight also creates smaller and smaller air currents. All of this basically creates, um, for some species, completely near silent flight. Um, there's several good um, NOVA or nature documentaries that really highlight that. And so if you're interested, I, I encourage you to look up those things if you want to learn more. And here's a, a, a great gray owl that's flying. You can see that facial disc, silent flight, and this facial disc just acts like a microphone. It's, it's listening for and hunting for, for food. Pretty impressive suite of traits to get by in a dark or near dark environment for this whole group of animals. <coughs> if we just look at owls as a group, and this is just North American owls that I'm talking about right now, but this holds for globally most likely. They're incredibly diverse in terms of how big they are, um, in terms of what they eat, and also where they, where they occur. 
And so in terms of North American owls, these are lined up from, um, in terms of size measurements, um, great gray owl, great horned owl, snowy owl, all the way down to the smallest known owl, uh, smallest known owl in the world, the, the elf owl. Um, we've got species that are adapted to forest and we focus on those. We've got Arctic species, we've got grassland species, desert species, and some species that are just cosmopolitan like the great horned owl that can occur in a wide variety of landscapes, including human cities. These um, five, and there's another species in here that's not depicted in this book, are this, the focal species for our work. We're, we're focusing on these small owls that occur mostly in forests of Western North America. Um, and, and so this is this group here. Um, and interestingly enough too, if you look, um, so here's, here's these guys are, are scaled by size, but the table to the left here shows average weight for the different species. Um, and it's in order of, of the table, but hopefully what you notice is great gray owl is our largest by size, but if you start to look at, at weight, um, actually, it's the great horned owl that is our biggest um, owl by weight. Um, hopefully, the other thing that you notice is that we also had to put in two different columns for the, the different um, sexes um, because for most owls and, and most raptors in general, we see this um, phenomenon we, we call reverse sexual size dimorphism. And it basically is that the, the female of the species tend to, to average larger, in some cases, quite larger than the males do, which is an interesting um, thing about raptors. So if we take a look at, uh, at where owls are um, globally, this is just a map that highlights the warm colors show more areas with more owl species, the cool colors show areas with um, fewer owl species. And if we just overlay known distributions of all the species, of documented species of, of owls on the globe, um, you start to get these hot spots that pop out. And you can see that basically um, Southeast Asia, South Africa, um, southern Brazil are all areas where we've got a lot of owl species and, and a lot of owl richness. There's also along the mountains in Mexico up into Western North America, some, some red and some orange. And so um, where we work and do our work is actually our, we're working in areas that are owl hotspots um, in North America. So think about that. If we look at that same map, and we, we think about priority. And this is this essentially basically priority is scaled by um, species that have few publications, so little is known about them, species where there's lots of knowledge gaps, and species that occur in areas where their habitat is, is known to be at risk. Um, we can basically um, identify areas where we should be paying attention to. And the other thing to notice here too is, is we're, again, not only we're working in areas where there are a lot of owls, but we're also working in areas where there's not a lot known about the owl species that are, are there. I'm going to zoom us in now um, to Southeast Arizona. And this is, um, this is a map out of a, a tree book for, um, for the mountains of Southeast Arizona. But what it does show nicely is this idea of sky islands. And so each of these green numbered locations on this map are mountain ranges that, that exceed at least 5,250 feet. And where you see red, these are at mountain ranges that exceed 9,000 feet. And so um, where you've got that green are high elevation areas and where you don't, all of this white and lowland area is desert. So essentially we refer to this area, this area is referred to as a sky island region um, in that we've got islands of mountains um, going up into the sky and basically a sea of desert that isolates those mountains to various degrees. And as a result, it's a very interesting place to do any kind of biodiversity work um, and research. And it's one of the more diverse um, locations in the United States in terms of just general biodiversity. Um, and this number 17 right here are the Chiricahua Mountains, and that's where we do our research on small owl communities here. And then again, we also work in northern Utah about that site here in a little bit. So why are there so many owl species? And, and actually, if you go, there's so many, basically just so much biodiversity in general um, in the Chiricahua Mountains and in the Sky Island regions. Um, it's because it's basically this convergent zone of four different biomes. We've got Sonoran Desert, 
species that show up in this area. We've got Chihuahuan desert species that show up in this area. We've got the species that we all know from the Rocky Mountains and the Colorado Plateau that occur in this area. And then we've got species from the Sierra Madre Occidental in New Mexico. Um, these are plants and animals that all converge and can occur in this area. So you get these unique combinations of, of animals in each one of these different, in plants, in each one of these different sky islands. And the Chiricahua Mountains right here are the largest of the sky islands in that region. And so it, as, as a result, it's a very biodiverse area. So much so that you go to where we work in the Chiricahua Mountains, um, there are six different species of small owls. Um, and you can sometimes hear at least four or five of them um, at one location without having to work very far um, at all. And so we've got the flammulated owl, which is a species of Western US forests. Um, we've talked a little bit about that all right, already. We've also got the elf owl, smallest owl in North America. Um, and basically we're kind of towards the, it's, it's northern part of its range is into um, Arizona and, and, and basically southern Utah. And we've got the whiskered screech owl, which we're just at the northern extent of its range um, in southern Arizona. So that's a unique species for that site. We also have northern pygmy owls, western screech owls, and northern sawwood owls. And so not only is this a unique combination of owl species, but what it, what's really exciting from a research perspective is there's a lot of variety in um, life history strategies uh, amongst and between the different members of this group. So for example, we've got a suite of insectivorous in, um, species, mostly insectivorous species in the flammulated owl, the elf owl, and the whiskered screech owl. So it's interesting to compare them between one another, but also to see how they differ from the northern pygmy owl, which is primarily a bird eater, but will also eat um, reptiles. Um, the western screech owl, which is a generalist hunter, so will eat birds, mammals, fish, um, reptiles, you name it, whatever it, it can catch, insects. Um, and then the northern sawwet owl, which is primarily a small mammal eater. So we've got a variety of different diets. We also have a variety of strategies, strategies in coping with um, seasonality. So we have some species that are migrants and some species that are residents year round. And then some species that are kind of, uh, the, the sawwet owl is, is a migrant slash nomadic species. They don't really tend to be counted or seen again along the same path um, where they migrate and, and breed, but they kind of just um, roam around. And so we've got an interesting suite of, of different traits to look at and think about how those species respond to different forest types and how those species might be um, at risk or um, how we need to consider how they, how they operate in terms of climate change in the future. From just a just cavity nesting species um, and cons conservation issues in general, uh, for this suite of owls, it's the same sort of suite that that are of, of risks or, or considerations that we need to make for a lot of different species. So we've got habitat degradation, change, and loss, and that's that's basically land cover driven by uh, uh, human activities, but that's also a long term thing and thinking about in terms of of habitat change with climate change as well. Um, we've got cavity loss in a lot of areas and competition for those cavities. So um, big old trees are becoming less and less common on in different landscapes and those big trees tend to have more tree cavities. And so as we lose those old trees, we're also losing potentially tree hollows, making that a limited resource in some areas um, and making that, that competition for some of those prime um, tree hollows potentially increasing in different areas. And then I kind of already hit on climate change impacts. So we've got range shifts and expansions, not only for those tree species that we were looking at at the beginning of, of, of the presentation, but we expect the ranges to shift for the different owl species as well, right? So think about uh, in the aspen forest, we've got pygmy owls, sawwood owls, and flammulated owls. And as those forests shift, we might expect the ranges of those species to shift too. And, and if you recall, in terms of aspen, there was a contraction. So there could be contracting ranges for those species. Um, interestingly enough, the southern species with uh, elf owls and whiskered screech owls, if you remember that oak um, series of, of projected locations for habitat, that, that emery oak zone was projected to move further north. And so that those two species might be species that we would 
um, predict might actually expand their ranges as the conditions become more conducive to, to them. So we've got to think about that. Um, we've also got to think about timing shifts in terms of when mi the migrants, when they, when they leave and when they get back and start breeding, um, but also lots of these species time their breeding to coincide with peak food availability. And so if, if those, those prey bases are, are responding to differences in moisture and temperature at a different, in a different way than the predators themselves, then you risk getting this mismatch of having um, young in the nest with high food demand at a time when food is no longer super abundant and that could have impacts on productivity. So we've got to consider that. Um, in areas where people also occur, we've got to think about contaminants like rodenticides and insecticides. And then the other thing that I, I kind of mentioned, some, so some of these six species, because they're active in the dark, um, because they're in remote forests, um, several of these species are just poorly studied. We don't have even um, large sample sizes on some natural history um, characteristics like how many eggs do they lay, how long do they incubate, and those sorts of things. And so our work here is going to help fill some of those knowledge gaps too. So for these six species, um, instead of taking time to go through each one of those, most of these species um, lay their eggs in a tree hollow and they'll incubate them from three to four weeks. Um, then once the young hatch, they'll, they'll, um, they'll brood them for, and they're in the, the nest cavity for another three to four weeks. Um, in terms of how many eggs each, each range, there's, there's variety between species, but they range from two to eight eggs for the most part. Um, and what you can see here, these are nestling um, northern sawwet owls. Ridiculously cute, I know. Um, but they are all from the same nest. They all been taken out and banded and, and put back into, it's a, a nest box in this case. Um, but what this shows, besides how cute sawwet owls are, is hopefully you notice there's this gradation in size. Here's the two beefy guys and then we've got this little guy down here. These were probably the first two eggs laid and he was the last um, leg, a, uh, egg laid. So owls have asynchronous hatching because females usually start incubating once they lay the second egg, but then they'll keep laying those eggs so that, so that the, uh, the timer on those eggs as they're incubating is slightly different on each of the eggs within, within a, um, a clutch. And so as a result, you get this, this size difference. Um, this was a good food year and the parents were good hunters. So after these two guys left the nest, everybody else um, started getting more food and, and this nest had um, all six of the young make it out. So where we work, here's North America. Our Northern Utah study site is just north of Salt Lake City. Here's Salt Lake City, here's Ogden, here's basically the Wasatch Range. And we work essentially all in here on the back side, so the east side of the mountains. Um, and in Southeast Arizona, we are just outside of Portal, Arizona. If you're into birds, you, you've heard of it before. It's a, it's a birding hotspot. We stay at a research station that's run by the American Museum of Natural History right here in the Chiricahua Mountains. So we're, we're right in our study zone, study area down there. Um, but these little triangles you can see are areas where we do habitat surveys and owl surveys and, and follow, follow nests in both Utah and Arizona. And the unique, unique thing about this setup is we've got three species that occur in both of those areas. So we can kind of compare timing uh, and basically habitat specific um, productivity and then breeding metrics between those areas. Um, and it's nice to have that latitudinal difference in terms of, of thinking about climate change and latitude and, and how that might impact flannelated owls or northern sawwood owls or pygmy owls, for instance. So what we're trying to understand specifically is what, what's going on with owl communities in different forest types. So here's a picture of, of a forest stand, an aspen stand in northern Utah, where we work, um, where we will basically survey for cavities and owls and look for nests and follow nests when we find them in this kind of aspen forest um, to understand how the owl community operates here. We're also working in um, riparian forest in southeast Arizona. Zona. These are like lowland stream um, bank forests that have Arizona sycamores, some oaks, some junipers. Um, this is roughly 5,000 feet. Um, there's usually, if it's a good year, um, running water. 
And there are a lot of birds and there are a lot of owls in this area. So we work in these riparian zones to do the same thing. And we also wanna compare that to coniferous forest up at 9,000 feet of elevation in the Chiricahua Mountains. What do owl communities look like here? Um, and also what do the available, available tree cavities look like too? So we're interested in comparing those different kinds of forests um, and understanding how owl communities work in those areas and how those communities are driven or, or um, set up relative to cavity availability and abundance and quality and those sorts of things. The other, the other component that we're also looking at here, um, because it's a big part of what goes on in Western forests and is becoming more and more a big part of that, is stands that have burned. So here's a picture of a stand, a uh, coniferous stand of forests in the high, high elevation area of the Chiricahua Mountains. Um, this is the result of a 2011 fire. So this is what the forest still looks like there today. This is, this is essentially eight years later. Um, the Horseshoe 2 fire burned the Chiricahua Mountains in 2011 and it, it, it burnt to varying degrees of severity 80% of the mountain range. So a wide, wide ranging um, burn. But we're interested in how those forests recover and we're particularly interested in, you know, when, when these areas do burn, what, what do the owl communities look like seven, eight, nine years after, after the burn and tracking that going forward um, and tying that to how many tree cavities are in these areas and how do they develop over time. And so we're working in those areas too um, to better understand that. Um, and the great thing about this too is that um, lots of different forest, um, forest service districts in areas across the west are um, paying attention to fire because we have to. It's becoming a, a common part. It, it is a common disturbance in, in the west. Um, but forest service in different areas are undergoing this firescape program where they're, they're actively trying to manage fuel loads and think about fuel, which has been um, an issue in Western forests and, and managed forests in the US for quite some time in terms of, of how we've suppressed fire. Um, but we've got more, higher fuel loads than we'd expect or we usually had in these areas. And so um, part of an effort to reduce the catastrophic nature and severity of fires is um, a program to try to reduce those fuel loads manually in different areas so that we can um, protect some of those forests and, and the fires that come through are more like they were historically where they burn through the understory and they don't necessarily take out an entire stand of forest like you see the results of this picture here. Um, and so the cool thing about that program and our, our research on cavity nesting owls is that we're engaged with the Forest Service um, in this area and basically telling them where um, we have um, tree cavities that are used by owls and, and high quality trees with tree cavities and they are um, making note of that and when they go in to reduce fuels they're they're retaining those important wildlife trees and so we're informing that management um, effort which is great. So I've kind of alluded to it but but here it is all wrapped up into uh, you know a single a single statement is is our goal is to characterize tree cavity di distributions densities and life cycles so we're almost thinking about these tree hollows as um, another organism and to understand how they vary in different forests um, and, and what they're influenced by. Is it by forest age? Is it by tree density? Is it canopy cover? Can we predict areas that have lots of cavities based on things that we can measure or data that exists for different kinds of forests? And then ultimately we want to understand how those things are impacted by climate change, but how, how that availability of cavities and that dynamic of how we expect tree cavities to change into the future um, might impact the cavity nesting community uh, of wildlife. And, and we're, we're focused on owls, but this will inform um, research on, on other birds, on bats, on mammals, and on amphibians that all use tree hollows in different forests in theory. So our teams go out um, and you learn your trees. Um, you learn how to measure tree density. You learn how to measure tree canopy cover. Um, you learn how to scan for and find tree cavities. And when you find a tree cavity, we collect a variety of data on, on those locations. We map them. Um, we hopefully, we're, we're really thrilled when we find nests because then we, we start to monitor those nests and oftentimes we'll find the same nest used um, year after year. So each new nest we find is, is great for the long-term efforts. 
We've put cavity plots in everywhere you see a triangle here. This is the Southeast Arizona site where we're trying to get coverage geographically and coverage in a variety of different forest types. Um, and then the other thing we'll be doing for a subset of these is we go back. And this was the first year that this is the fourth, fourth year of the effort where we've gone back and recorded data on the same plots to see how many cavities did we gain and how many cavities did we lose um, in three years. And our, and our goal will be to do that over time to sort of get a, a rate of loss and rate of gain of, of tree hollows um, in different forest types. So we measure how large the trees are, um, the density. Um, here is a team basically using a painter's pole extended as far as it can get um, to, to use a camera to peer into a tree cavity to see if there's anything in it. Even if there's nothing in it, we still map it and collect data on it. Um, and we use that to be able to summarize in terms of the forest types that we're looking at, on average, how many cavities are there per hectare? What's the canopy cover of that forest? What's the tree density? And basal area of that forest. Um, and our, our, our end goal is hopefully to be able to say if we have forest that has this canopy cover, this basal area, and this number of trees um, per acre, does that explain how many cavities we can expect to find in that? And if it does, then we can predict tree cavities elsewhere. And that's our, that's our goal. Um, and you can see from, from, from these total in, of data here, um, this riparian, the sycamore bottom lens in, in um, the Chiricahua Mountains is by far our, our highest cavity density at 52 or 56 um, per hectare. Um, Aspen forest is pretty high. If you go up to the high elevation forest, only 14 um, cavities per hectare on average. So cavities might be limiting up high, but not necessarily down low in, in this setting. And, and so we hope to tease out how that explains the owls that we, we survey and, and find and monitor too. Uh, when we are mapping those tree cavities, um, we get a lot of a lot of empty tree hollows. Like I said, we re record data on those. Um, but our ultimate goal is when we're doing this is to find those those nests. And so here is our treetop peeper cam. Um, here's an image of what you see from the ground when you're looking at the screen to see what's on those those cameras. And these are some images from this past season. Um, we have elf, an elf owl nest that we found, and you can see one, two, three, four little elf owl. Um, Owlet heads right there. Here's another elf owl nest. Um, this bird wasn't too happy that um, we interrupted its daytime sleep. And here's an image of a uh, whiskered screech owl nest that we found. You can see an egg right here. And there's basically there are four, there are four eggs that she was sitting on. Um, and our ultimate goal when we find things like this is that we'll then go back um, every week to 10 days and check on the progress of that nest so that we can know um, ultimately, hopefully, as much information as we can get. Um, how many eggs, what was the date that we found those eggs, how many hatched, and ultimately hopefully see how many of those come out of the nest. And so this picture here are four um, fledged whiskered screech owls, and those are, at least one of those was this egg, and the other three were the three eggs that were underneath that female right there. And so we follow the, the nesting attempts when we know about the nests um, to, to finish so that we can know the ultimate outcome. When we only know that there's a territory, we also go back and do survey work during the day and we can hear fledglings that are out. And so while we may not know the nest location, um, we know that the territory was there for a certain amount of time and we know that it successfully um, reared young. And that's also uh, a useful piece of information too. So we kind of collect data, uh, tiers of, of detail. In terms of the effort so far, this is just a breakdown of, um, these are all just scientific names of different trees. This is the number of trees that we've found. These are cavities. So we've mapped 1,035 tree cavities um, so far. Um, this is the percentage of them that were alive. This is the average height, average uh, min and max height. And this basically just starts to describe that, that population of tree cavities and where it occurs. And you can see that um, you know, by far we see the most tree cavities in um, Platanus radii, which is Arizona sycamore right here. So those bottom blend areas, that, that white um, trunk tree, lots of tree cavities there, lots and lots of tree cavities in quaking aspen. Here, this, most of this, these data are from our, our northern Utah site. Um, and you can see there's a variety of different other different species. So um, starting to track where we find the most tree hollows and hopefully over time how those change. And all of that ties back to the, the owl community. And so we don't just rely on finding nests and tree cavities to, to know where the owls are. We also do night work. So if you come out 
um, and I don't know if anyone is 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 here that's been on the expedition, um, but we work. We work day. Um, and we put in a day shift and we put in a night shift. And at night we go out and we survey for owls, um, and we do that by broadcasting those songs like I was playing a little while ago um, at fixed points, and then listening and documenting what we hear, and then switching through the different species. And so here is a you know a result of what we detected in just one year of of surveys. Um, and this is from um, Arizona, but you can see we, we heard a whole lot of whiskered screech owls, a whole lot of elf owls. They're the two most common species in, in that study site. Um, but when we do detect an owl, if the bird comes in, um, sometimes they'll come in rather aggressively because they're defending their territory. Um, if we get a good response, then we'll also actually try um, to capture that bird so that we can put a, a, a band on it with a unique identifier so that if we ever encounter it again, um, we know that we, we know where it came from, we know where it was originally banded, we know how long it lived, and kind of movement, and I'll show you some of that information here in a second. So those, those nighttime surveys can basically let us, let us see where owl territories are, right? And so on this map here, here's the Chiricahua Mountains, this is Cave Creek Canyon coming in, um, this is South Fork, this is going up to the research station. Um, each one of these polygons is a, basically a, a territory of a different owl pair, and they're color-coded for different owl species. So red are flammulated owls, you can see we had flammulated owls in these areas, um, blue are western screech owls, and you see we had different pairs of western screech owls in, in these areas this year. Um, the green are whiskered screech owls, and then the yellow are elf owls. And you can see that these green and yellows are, are quite common um, and, and become quite packed in. Teams learn to become owl catching machines. So I, I don't do this work, um, participants on the expedition do this. So the first thing we do basically the first night when we get to to the station and, and I'm actually nice enough that I, I let us do it during the day um, is that we practice putting up mist nets. So these are our nets on 24 foot telescoping poles. Um, they are kind of fine hair net like uh, monofilament that have different panels and basically the teams practice um, stringing these nets up um, across an open area getting them on the poles and raising them up um, as high as we can get them um, as quickly as they can do during the day. And then the next thing that we do is we go out and we try to do it in the dark. Um, and so teams do this and we get the nets up and then someone has a speaker with playback. And essentially we, we utilize that strong response from the species. Um, someone on the team will have the speaker and they will basically be on the opposite side of the net of the owl um, and play the song and the owl will fly across and up and over the net. And if that's the case, then you run to the other side of the net, you do the same thing, and you can see that this might take a lot of time. And in some cases it does um, take quite a bit of time before we, we catch the owl, um, but it actually does work at, at various points in time. And we, we do actually have a good amount of success. And, and I, you know, I describe it as basically we're fishing for owls in the dark using sound. Um, and once we catch those birds, we collect feathers for genetic work uh, we put a band on them, we collect weight data, we try to identify sex when we can, um, and then um, we set them free. So on a good night, we'll catch some owls. There's a pair of western screech owls right here. Here's a whiskered screech owl. Here's a whole family of flammulated owls. The two adults were caught using a net. Um, the three young here were pulled out of, the nest, of a nest box with a ladder you can see in the background there. On a really good night, we get three elf owls. That doesn't happen too often. And we use that data and the fact that the, band, the birds have individual numbers to be able to say, oh, if we catch a whiskered screech out here, he's this number, we catch the whiskered screech out here, it's a different unique number and that helps us identify territory boundaries, territory owners, and between years we oftentimes will have um, the same territory holder um, that we catch um, in subsequent years. So for instance, this male whiskered screech owl, we caught three years in a row, um, and this year, the owl that we got here was a new owl, so he's no longer holding that territory. And that's useful information in terms of thinking about community dynamics. Same sort of thing. Here's the research station where we stay. And this is just to give you a sense of, so these are owls that we detect on our surveys and the different numbers, that's whiskered screech owl 18. We, you know, we track upwards of 25 different whiskered screech owl territories in a given year. They are very abundant in this area. Um, 
the different codes. Here's elf owl, here's a flammulated owl. And this triangle kind of gives you a sense of, we caught the bird here, we caught the bird here on a different night, and here on a different night that same season. And piecing those different locations together is how we get those polygons and estimate that, that territory size. <clears throat> so you can see we do a lot of work, um, but we have a lot of different questions that we're, we're trying to answer. Um, and and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, we couldn't do it without the community scientists that, that Earthwatch helps us, you know, provides us to, to, to get the work done. The people power is incredible. Um, our team members learn to do all of these different things listed here. You learn owl identification by sound. You learn tree identification. We use GPSs. We install a sampling grid. You learn to estimate tree density using a keyhole prism. DBH tape to measure tree hollows or tree diameters. Um, you map in search for tree cavities, um, you know, nocturnal surveys, set up and take down of mist nets, owl capture using an audio alert to capture. We also sample insect prey using malaise trap. I didn't have time to get into that too much, um, but this is all towards collecting data for this long-term study of communities of owls and tree hollows, and we, we wouldn't be able to do it um, without all the help that we get from participants. Uh, we just finished our fourth year, Stan mentioned at the beginning, um, up to this point we've had 270 different community scientists come on Earthwatch expeditions um, to help collect data to understand forest owls in the West. Um, they've been, we've had 14 year olds all the way up to 83 year young people come out and help us collect these data. Um, uh, so far 120 of these have been teen groups, which is which is a lot of fun. We've had teens from Seattle, teens from various spots in LA, and a lot of teens from um, New York. Um, and it's, um, besides collecting the technical data, which is really rewarding as, as a scientist to be able to, um, to have folks come out that have never spent any time in the dark in the woods or even off of a sidewalk at various times and, and see, um, you know, the, the stars at night, um, the owls um, at night and during the day, and then basically just appreciate that the lands that we work on, most of them are their public lands. Um, that's a great component of, um, of, of this project from my perspective, because then, um, you know, hopefully at least 110 of these 120 um, individuals are, are going to value those public lands and make decisions going forward that will help conserve those and those will keep forests where they are. Um, those will help, uh, you know, conserve areas where we expect forests to be in the future and hopefully we'll have owls in those areas too. Uh, in terms of, of reach, we've had folks from 36 different states and five different countries come on the trip. So that's, that's great in terms of exposure for the work we're doing. And, and, and it, anyone that goes on the trip will tell you that um, you'll never look at a tree or a hole in a tree uh, the same way again after spending a week with us either in Utah or Southeast Arizona. So anyway, thanks for your, your time. I hope you uh, enjoyed it and learned something. And I don't know, we have time for some questions, Stan? Well, I'll try to squeeze one in because a couple people have asked a very similar question. And for those that were not able to answer uh, directly through the webinar, we'll try to answer online um, and have those answers typed out and available as best we can. But thank you so much, Dave. Thanks for your, it's like a master class on owl ecology squeezed into the middle of our days here. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you all for taking the time to uh, chime in and listen. Thank you for your questions. Um, I'm going to do ask this question because it pops up in a, from a couple different people, and that is, um, do you worry? Do you worry about declining owl populations? And what are things that can be done to ensure that we have owls in our lives, inspiring us uh, for generations to come? Yeah, um, that's that's a good question, and I don't. You know, we could take a, another hour to answer it, um, you know, thoroughly. But I think. Um, from what we know, and, and like I said before, the, um, one of the main take homes for a lot of these species is that they're, they're understudied. They're what we consider knowledge gap species. So even in the year 2019, in some, some of the forests in, in the Western US, we, you know, we don't have a super accurate map of, of not even where they occur, but certainly in terms of population sizes. Um, but with shrinking forests and, shrink and, and, and associated declines in nesting cavities, we expect that some of these forest species are probably declining. Um, so one of the things you can do is to retain tree cavities, re re retain those big old 
trees in, in forests, but even in city parks and county areas and open spaces um, to create uh, a, a, or at least maintain that, that really crucial element of the habitat for this suite of species. They, you know, they, they can't build their own. So those, you know, that this, this tree hollow that you're looking at here with this pair of whiskered screech owls has probably played host to generations of whiskered screech owls. And so just keeping that on the landscape is important. Um, thinking about the practices in terms of managing forest and even your own yard. Think about, you know, maybe you don't like insects or voles in your, in your area, um, but give these raptors that are highly specialized and, and built to eat those things the chance to clear those populations out for you, um, maybe instead of putting out um, rodenticides or insecticides or things like that. Um, and then just, you know, making decisions that keep forest space um, out there on the landscape will go a long ways towards helping owls and other species. Okay, Dave, there are a couple more questions, but I want to end on a fun one. <laughs> What's your favorite owl and why? The one that we just let go and got an awesome piece of information about. Ah. Um, <laughs> In general, right. Yeah, that's, that's the most politic owl. Um, you know, I've, I've spent a long time, um, a, a long time, a good portion of my career studying flammulated owls. And so they'll always be near and dear to my heart. And that whole scenario of all those different pressures um, in terms of cavity loss, forest lots, uh, being insectivorous, um, you know, makes that a really interesting species. I didn't even get to the, the you know, I mentioned briefly that they're migrants. And so we know um, from some work that we've done in Utah and California and Colorado and Washington that those, those, those guys tend to winter down in, in sort of central Mexico from geolocator work, um, but we're just now, the work is just now being done by other flammulated owl researchers to get fine detailed data on where they are spending their time down there. So that's interesting. I'm a big fan of whiskered screech owls and, and elf owls right now because they're new and they're, they're you know, you might've noticed from the map, they're super abundant down there, but they're also, the, they're, they're the species that are, um, of, of all of the six of them, probably the least um, studied. So I'm excited about what we're learning from about those guys. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dave. And thanks to your entire research team. It's not just you in the field. You've got folks helping you out in uh, the Chiricahuas and up in Utah. Um, hats off to them for their dedication to the field, to the research. And thank you so much for everything that you've done uh, as a, an amazing PI for as an Earthwatch and Hawkwatch scientist. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I couldn't do it without my team. So, yeah, you know it. Yeah. and all of the participants that come out the, and field Absolutely. on our expeditions. Yeah. So, thanks for having me. Thank you, sir.